Yesterday evening marked my first true session with the girl. Signs of significant disorder are greater than I initially thought. Her imagination is vast, but one phrase in particular has become an earworm of sorts. He was right in front of me, breathing hard. That's what I remember most. The awful smell. Like when sausage goes bad. Scent while dreaming is a rarity. An indication of sensory transcendence. She may be a fine candidate for a neurological study. But her health must come first. There are undoubtedly other details I missed in her recount. From the top, then. Sleep be damned tonight. You're listening to The Sounds of Nightmares. An audio fiction series from the world of Little Nightmares. in the walls. This is the counsellor. Herein are my preliminary case notes for tape number 54, session number 1, patient number 1220... Oh, referring to children by numbers. Our relationship goes beyond mere ethics, so I can leave that practice to the heartless quacks on the upper floors. But to remain professional, I'll use a moniker the girl's given herself. Noon. Noon has been in CPI care for a fortnight. Given her rather remarkable medical history, her mental state seems relatively unremarkable. She finds herself in my ward due to worsening, though not recurring, nightly afflictions. Parasomnia isn't uncommon among patients. Not to imply she's unworthy of treatment, only that there are others worse off. Noon also displays signs of mild trauma. As such, nightmare disorder is possible. Given her diffidence, the focus for this session is to build rapport. I'm hopeful Noon will open up and will learn what lies inside that little head. Oh, damn! Take the big chair, Noon. Sit, lie, saddle it like a horse, whatever you please. How's that? Fine, I guess. That look on your face says there's more on your mind. It's... It's like the music I used to hear through the walls. In our old apartment, before we moved into the fancy house. Would you like to talk about that? Your old apartment? No, counsellor. All right. An easier question to start. How are you feeling today? Bit sad. For any reason in particular? Um, the red flower Mum and Dad left. It went all wrinkled. I tried lifting a petal and it broke off. But then I saw why. Little crawlies. Everywhere underneath the dirt. 
aphids. How unpleasant. Must be hard here all alone. That wasn't just the flower to you, was it? No, Councillor. Your parents only want you to feel like you again. And we'll see to that. One day at a time. Have you been sleeping? Yes, Councillor. Call me Otto. Sleeping well? Yes. Noon, this is a place of honesty. The truth, please. Fine. Middle of the night. I keep waking. And are you perspiring? Um... Sweating? Oh, uh, yes. And my heart beats like there's a pecking bird in my chest. Did these nightmares coincide with the onset of your sickness? No, only after. And do you remember your nightmares or do they disappear come morning? I remember. Everything. Would you be alright to tell me about them? Now or later? Yes. Um. The one I had last night, it's still here. The feeling. But may I have some juice? My head's light and Mum says it helps. I'm not sure that's true. Regardless, you may. I see you eyeing my painting. I've had it since I was a boy. The Zahir's Gaze, it's titled. Why is it so blurry? It's a hidden image. The trick is to unfocus your eyes. Try it. There. Can you make it out now? No. I've got an idea. Keep your eyes on the painting. Let your mind wander. Meanwhile, you can tell me your dream. If you've finished your juice. I have. From the beginning, then. It started when I woke up. Somewhere I didn't belong. Describe this place, please. Everything was white. Only slowly I realized snow was falling on a field. The view was peaceful looking out from so high up. Like I was one with the cold. You felt this cold? Not like the counties in winter, but more like watching someone who was chilled. Around me, but not in me. I turned away from the window, which was only a hole in the stone wall of the curved passageway that stretched on the long ways. This odd feeling told me to get up, but I couldn't stand because the ceiling was so low. I crawled ahead and, if not for the tiniest bit of light, I would have fallen. Another passageway appeared on the floor, its edges throbbing in the dark. Suddenly I, I heard a clinking from below. That same feeling told me I was lost inside a giant. A huge one made out of stone, and the only way out was to keep going through its veins. I climbed into the pitch dark, and immediately began sliding down the icy wetness, going and going, faster and faster. I thought the slide would never end, and just then... It shot me out. Did it hurt? Not like when you fall for real. I can see what it is now. The painting. A tiger and two moons. That's not quite right. I've never seen a tiger before. Keep trying. Remember to unfocus. Continue as you wish. An orange glowing came from a candle. But the light didn't reach the room's corners. A tiny hole had been cut out of the stone beside me. 
The snow, I thought. How nice it would be to watch fall again. I looked through, but there was no snow. Only a room brimming with glass jars. Light danced through them, coming from a doorway on the opposite side, until a figure stepped through it. This huge man wore a long coat and fishing hat. His face kind of dripped as he watched me. Then he was gone. Or he wasn't, I can't remember. It's the only thing I can't remember. Could it have been someone you know? Your father, perhaps? No, this man doesn't belong to our world. I don't quite follow. That's just the feeling he gave. You keep mentioning this feeling. Can you try to explain? You can't understand. Not unless you were there. You just can't. It's all right, Noon. We don't have to talk about him. Relax. Breathe. Turning from the hole, I spotted an exit on the far wall. That's where the clinking was the loudest. I started towards it when a shadow ran out from the corner. That of a child, I shouted, Hey! Where are we? Where are we? But quiet as a mouse, he climbed through the pulsing exit. And carelessly, I followed. The room over was bigger and the child was gone. All over the walls and floors were more pulsing passages, like living ant tunnels. All kinds of springs laid about, and little oil cans and strange tools. <gasps> Suddenly, footsteps approaching, matching the rhythm of the clinking. Knowing I didn't belong, I hid behind a wooden box. Peeking up, I saw other small shadows entering the room. They stepped by each other silently. Most passed into different doors, but two stayed behind, searching through the springs. They were not children, not at all. Even in dim light, they remained shadows. Things not quite there, as if forgotten, not wanting to be seen. They held nasty tools and their empty faces showed they weren't very bright. Both stood, looked down the passageway, and jumped. With nowhere to go, I did the same, climbing to the platform below. I finally saw what was making all that noise. Golden spinning wheels. Fat ones, small ones, skinny ones. And they went down so deep I couldn't see the end. I didn't know what they were until that faraway feeling came back and told me. They were gears, with teeth which locked perfectly into one another, clicking on and on the song that never stopped. There were a hundred, hundred of the dull little shadows, working to keep the mechanisms going. I felt, without their doing, the gears would surely stop and the giant would break apart stone by stone. But as I leaned over the edge, distracted, my foot must have not to wrench. All the shadows stared up and a few began climbing my way. They moved separately, but as one. I panicked and tucked between a set of levers. In the tight space, my dress got caught on the tooth of massive gear. It pulled me up and around until my dress tore, shooting me onto a pipe below, where I lost my grip only to hit another platform. The shadows stopped chasing me, working again as 
the yank of the piece of my dress, now stuck between two gears, causing all the others to slow. While they were bothered, I took the chance to escape. The wall in front of me went went down and around forever and ever, along with the mechanisms. I grabbed onto a rod, sliding on, when a big creak groaned above and the gears went right back to singing their song. The ripped fabric floated down before me, passing by a tiny crack in the stone. Painful cries came through it. I shouldn't have wanted to know what was on the other side, but I did. A small room with chains covering the floor and three identical nun-like dresses, freshly pressed, hanging by a bed. Then, the chains jangled and my heart stopped. A frail body slumped against the wall, a chain round his neck. He was right in front of me, breathing hard. That's what I remember most, the awful smell. Like when sausage goes bad. Hold on a minute, Noon. You distinctly smelt his breath? Not his breath. Him. So rotten, it still stings my nose now. How certain are you? You told me to tell the truth, no. I am. Do you still want to hear the rest of my nightmare? Otto? Hmm? Uh, oh, apologies. My mind was divided, and, and that's not fair to you. Anyways. Looking through that crack, I realised something. I was inside the walls, like a rat. On the other side was an entire world. And everything got worse from there. Lower and lower, I climbed until I'd gone down so deep that there was nothing but steam and darkness. And louder ticking, back and forth, back and forth. Wanting to give up, I sat listening. I'd nearly fallen asleep when suddenly a small shape crawled out from inside the wall below. Another worker came for me, I thought. But when they looked up, I saw their eyes. A child, for certain this time. And their hair was covered in goo, which made it hard to tell if they were a boy or a girl. Still, I climbed down, full of energy. Nearly the amount I used to have. We stood in silence, a moment. Stuck in their hair was black liquid moving like smoke. What's in your... I started, but they put a hand over my mouth. Not until they pointed at the wall did I understand why. It's another crack led to yet another chamber. It was a hideous workshop. All around were half-made projects built from wood and metal with all kinds of straps and cranks. Their shapes made my chest tighten. A collection masks was on the shelves with screws and spikes on them, positioned to fit perfectly into a mouth. A tall woman bent over a new project, wearing a familiar dress, long heavy chains coming out under its tail. Hmm. 
she moaned, enjoying herself. I could feel she'd been at it for hours. Her presence alone told that she was the keeper of the stone giant, of the world beyond the walls. Turning to a pile of scraps, I saw her face. Equally old and young, and her skin stretched back so tight that only her eyes seemed human. I wanted so badly to know what she was building and to scream all the same. But before I could do either, my new friend pulled me away. They pointed up from between the planks. A shadow studied us. The child pulled my arm, but it was already too late. The worker looked down beside me, inspecting my body like a tool, reaching out with its wrench. But the child pushed me away, letting a sliver of light shine out from the workshop to hit the shadow. Faster than fast, tucked back into darkness, desperate to keep hidden. Why have you stopped? I'm thinking. The next bit is hard to describe. The nightmare. It shifted. Steam reached around us. And we came to a place at the bottom of the gears. Between the walls. In front of us. A long pendulum whooshed back and forth. My friend grabbed hold as it swung by. I let it go past. One. Two. Three times before finding the courage to do the same. We climbed as the pendulum rocked left and right, making my head dizzy. Just a little more, I repeated to myself, until my friend reached out a hand to pull me up. We'd made it. Finally, the center of the clock. The room was round with a spiral staircase and a machine made of little metallic fingers tapping a violent rhythm. The ceiling was a white clock face, but all the numbers were wrong. We immediately ran up the stairs and at the top, we stepped out into a courtyard. My body began shaking as I heard them. Shouts and shrieks of pain. All I could do was stare up at the circular walls, which I had just been inside. This was the true building. There were a million rooms like the second one I paid into, all the way up with hands and limbs reaching out from between the bars that kept them locked in. My heart pounded like one of them, a prisoner trying to get free. I shouted, wait, wait please. please. But my friend was across the courtyard. Then, a jingling. The tall woman jumped down from above, and with thumping steps, she went after my friend. A chain leapt out beneath her dress, like a snake. It caught their leg, and the woman dragged the child through the snow, kicking and yelling. My friend, scared to tears, yelled for help, and the woman spotted me. She began plodding my way and fear froze my feet, getting closer and closer and all I could think was, who brought me here and why was I made to know these secrets? With skin so tight, her mouth opened only a sliver with blackened teeth inside, hungry for something. Something that swelled inside me. Then I woke up. That's awful, Noon. I'm sorry. The woman in particular sounds disturbing. Yes, but she didn't scare me most. Not after I woke up. It was the workers. Hmm. Because they were mindless? No, because they were hidden. 
Nobody knew they existed. That's how I feel sometimes. Since getting the water sickness, as if things are in my body, but instead of making me tick, they're killing me, like the bugs in the flower pot. Oh, I can feel them in my head. Noon, listen to me. I'll do everything within the limits of my command to help you. But there's nothing bad inside you. Nothing. Um, all right. I have one more question, and then I think it's enough for your first day, okay? Okay. Noon, have you ever heard of mutual dreaming? Mutual dreaming? Sharing the experience with another person. How could what's in my head be in someone else's head? And who would I share it with? Questions that have hounded my outer colleagues for years. Your perception of temperature and smell while dreaming is sometimes thought to be an indicator of this transpersonal phenomenon. While I'm not convinced of its ontological validity, I long to study a case like yours. Unfortunately, I've only known one other person to exhibit this faculty. Years ago... Who? Were they like me? My... beloved Cece. And not quite. In any case, my ambitions fell off. I, I lost sight of many things. But you've stimulated a part of me nearly forgotten. Oh. I think I see it now, Otto. Yes, that's right. We're in this together. No, the painting. Oh. It's a map of stars and two circles around it. Yes, good. An astrolabe, in fact. Astrolabe? An ancient instrument used to locate positions in time and space. Now, surely you're exhausted. I don't want to go to my room to sleep. Will, will you walk me back? Of course. And we can't forget your nightly confectionery. Here, Noon. Take your pick. Sweets for my sweet. listen to the first episode of The Sounds of Nightmares. This episode was written by Lonnie Nadler. Our showrunner is Lonnie Nadler, and the series is directed by Toma Hoses. Noon is played by Amy Pursehouse, and Otto by Kester Lovelace. Music created by Tobias Livia and Toma Hoses. Production supervised by Alizé Debar and Lucille Rousseau-Garcia. This series is based on Little Nightmares from Bandai Namco Europe.